the work piece is going to at some point crumble as well. Exactly. I feel like everybody would inherently pick family over work. Well, it's looking at the larger picture. Of course, sometimes you, you must compromise, proving that the best career decisions are based on what matters most to you in your life. I guess it sounds weird to say I would pick work over my family. Well, you might not say that in polite company, but yeah, you might yeah, think, yeah. what kind of father am I? What kind of father do I want to be? What do my children need from me? It's kind of one of those hard things to figure out, right? But if you know what matters to you, it's a lot easier. I had no clue what was happening. It was only because my kids were saying, you got to come home, Dad. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Great Leadership. My guest today, Dr. Stuart Friedman. Uh, organizational psychologist at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, also the founding director of the Wharton Leadership Program, and you also founded, I heard, the uh, Wharton's Work-Life Integration Project, which I want to talk to you about as well. So, Stu, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Jacob. It's great to be here. So, a lot of questions for you. Um, why don't we start off with just a little bit of background information about you and some of the the research and the work that you have been doing in the world of leadership, because you've been studying this and practicing this and implementing some of this stuff uh, for probably uh, many, many years. Uh, mm -hmm. How'd you get involved with all this stuff? Well, uh, I was a graduate student at the <clears throat> University of Michigan in organizational psychology in the early 80s. And um, that's when I really got uh, involved in exploring the world of leadership and how people grow mm. and create freedom in their lives um, over the course of their lives. And my research for my dissertation was about how large organizations prepare and select people for uh, executive roles, so the, the top three levels of oh. Fortune 500 companies. What year was that uh, dissertation? 1984. Oh my University. goodness. <laughs> One yeah. year after I was born. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, stop it. That's not, that's not helpful, Jacob. <laughs> uh, well, I'm just so, kidding. I'm, I'm very, I'm well, so I'm so, very curious. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. go on and then I'll jump back to your discussion. Well, just, you know, so I got deeply involved in uh, leadership development and succession um, and succession planning and talent management systems. And that's what I wrote about in what I think was the first large-scale study of, of, of that subject. And I looked at the impact or the correlation, really, between how an organization went about doing the work of cultivating the next generation of talent and its reputation and financial performance and drew mm. some conclusions from that about what good practice looked like. So I spent um, a good chunk of the 80s uh, in terms of my research and practice on, on that subject area. Uh, but things changed later in the 80s when my first child was born. Uh, that was after we had two miscarriages. And it was, uh, it was just a magical and very compelling moment when I met my first child for the first time, holding him uh, and, and thinking, what am I going to do now to <laughs> ensure that he grows up in a in a world that is safe and nurturing. And I couldn't get that question out of my head, including when I went back into my Wharton MBA classroom in October of 1987 and said to the students, we're putting aside the lecture, you, the, lecture the class you prepared for today. I want to <clears> ask <throat> you and talk about another subject, and that is what are you as future business leaders going to do about ensuring the cultivation of the next generation, not of talent in your business, but the next generation, full stop. And that conversation uh, that day led me to shift my focus to looking at uh, what I could develop in terms of practical knowledge, useful knowledge about how to improve performance in all the different parts of life yeah. work and family and community and your private self um, in creative ways. And I could say more about that, but I'll pause for now. Yeah. And, and we're definitely going to touch on that too, because I think it's a very interesting um, 
kind of a framework and approach that you have towards leadership. But I'm actually curious if you go back to that dissertation you wrote in 1984 when you were looking at the, the criteria that people or that organizations use to promote leaders. Do you remember what those criteria were? The, the qualities that we looked at uh, had to do with such things as <clears throat> the, the resources that were dedicated to uh, you know, formal uh, executive development programs. Uh, we explored in, in some depth the role that the um, HR people played in uh, serving both as talent scouts and as um, strategic advisors on uh, the movement of people uh, in terms of uh, fostering their development as well as their selection. Okay, um, that was that was a uh, one of the critical components. Uh, another was the extent to which uh, organizations systematically used the criterion of uh, when moving people. Uh, at, at the middle, early middle, and then later stages of their careers, whether any aspect of those uh, choices in terms of internal mobility were driven by the developmental opportunity in that new role. So were, was it just a matter of filling slots with who's ever available, or did they consciously look to see how is a person going to grow mm. by taking this role? So those were those were some. There were other considerations, but those were some of the important ones. And so what did you find from that research? And just to kind of give you a sense of where I'm going, I'm curious if there's been any change or difference since when you wrote that dissertation nearly 40 years ago uh, to today's world. And if everything that you discovered uh, in 1984 is still applicable and just as relevant, or if you were redoing that research and that dissertation today, would, would there be some other things that you'd be looking at? Would there be any differences? You know, I haven't thought about that uh, lately, but uh, it's a fascinating question. And uh, I think the, the, the observation that uh, the, the, the sort of core of it was it pays to invest in people development. Uh, and, and, uh, that has become now uh, a sort of de rigueur you know, requirement uh, for most large organizations and medium and small ones too now. But back in the day, you know, 40 years ago, that wasn't an accepted idea. Hmm. And so it wasn't, it, it wasn't norm, normative. Uh, you know, some companies did it, others didn't. Um, or, and some companies said they did, but didn't really take it very seriously. So I think one of the main things that's changed uh, is the, you know, the accepted wisdom that your company benefits uh, on all dimensions, you know, economically as well as uh, in terms of doing good in the world by helping people to grow um, in directions they want to go. Hmm. I, I th you know, that's now. You know, nobody really questions that, uh, and so uh, we, you know, we'd be asking different questions today. Of course, the uh, uh, about you know what those investments look like and how they're made. I, I think the uh, you know in the in the in the eighties, it was just becoming um, uh, accepted practice and and uh, envied practice to have some sort of institute or separate. Uh, entity that was devoted to education. Hmm. And indeed, uh, 15 years after that or so, I was asked by the head of Ford Motor Company to join that company as the head of global leadership development for, for Ford, which I did for a few years. I took leave from Wharton and, and did that uh, role as, as sort of the, you know, the dean of the Ford Leadership Academy. And that that was something that many 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 companies were doing, and and mm. now I think there is, um, you know, because of you know the digital revolution and and the new ways that people are learning, uh, we'd be asking a lot of different questions about um, how you know the the various modalities that are used for learning and development, and how 
uh, how success in those enterprises is measured, the much more sophisticated systems for that. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I think we'd focus on today if, if I was to do that again, but I'm not going yeah. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, really quick, do you wanna hear something crazy? Over 96% of the people who watch these videos on this channel are not subscribed. Why don't we fix that? If you wanna get access to more awesome videos just like this one, make sure to hit subscribe so you'll get notified when they get released. Uh, so let's talk about uh, your time at Ford a little bit. So I'm, I'm really interested in that when I read that in your bio too. So can you talk a little bit about how did you get connected with Ford? And, and, after your, and what was that process like? So you get the call, hey, we want you to come into Ford, lead, uh, create a leadership academy here. You say, great. And, and then what? Like, how did you formalize that training? What exactly were you teaching these 2,500 managers a year inside of Ford? Mm -hmm. uh, like, I'm, I'm just really curious how that program was structured because a lot of people who listen and watch this show are current or aspiring leaders themselves. And they're thinking about their training, their leadership, their development. Uh, so can you share a little bit about what was going on at Ford there? Well, one of my mentors at Michigan was Noel Tishy, that's T-I-C-H-Y. And he had been working with Ford. And when they decided that they wanted to um, create a leadership academy or institute, uh, he recommended me. Hmm. And so um, I did an uh, extensive series of interviews uh, with various executives uh, in in the organization, and um, you know they chose me, hmm. uh, which I'm very grateful for. And and when I got there, the last and most consequential interview was with the CEO, who had just arrived, and w was uh, into into that role. He'd been an internal Ford executive for you know for decades. Who, but who was the just, CEO at the time? Uh, this was Jack Nasser. Ah, okay. Um, this was 1999, and part of his culture change strategy was to hire uh, 30 new executives in the top 300 of that 300,000-person company from outside of the company and and, and in from uh, excuse me from other industries as well. Hmm. And so, so this was, was like a, a whole... foreign thing; like companies didn't do this stuff before. Well, the idea of, of hiring within the space of a few months, 30 new senior executives from outside of the company, that was, that was a jolt yeah. uh, you know, to, to the system. That was a part of his change strategy to reorient the organization from simply being a, an inward-looking, manufacturing, uh, engineering-centric uh, enterprise to one that was looking outward to the marketplace and to new vistas for ideas for innovation. So I was a part of that move, that uh, movement, and arriving there was uh, was a great shock uh, because I'd been working with a lot of companies as a consultant and as a researcher, uh, but I was primarily an educator and scholar. Um, I'd had a lot of uh, executive responsibility within my academic role, having founded the leadership program and the work-life integration project. Both of those involved a lot of executive <laughs> responsibility. But this was very, very different. Um, having you know, a genuine boss, uh, <laughs> because in, in academia, you don't yeah. have that. Um, so that was... Uh, it took a while before I figured out, um, you know, having consulted to a lot of people, coached them uh, in executive roles, being in that role was a very different thing. Um, and overwhelming at first, got a lot of help from a lot of incredible people. And, you know, the goal there was to help people at different levels um, to to advance and stretch their capacities to lead so that they would be as successful as we could help them become at the next level. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what this means for you know, people aspiring to leadership uh, in their own lives and careers, certainly one of the things that I now 
believe and feel very confidently in my belief is that one should always be learning as a leader. It's something that you can do your whole life. In fact, all the great leaders do that. They take seriously the idea that you have to continue to cultivate your own knowledge as a leader in terms of what that means for you. And there's a lot of different ways of going about doing that, but no one's going to do it for you. Yep. So in, in making that uh, an explicit part of what you're about uh, in terms of your professional life and identity is, uh, is something that you, you, can, you can't start too soon and you can, and you can never end. It's, it's kind of like uh, being a professional athlete <laughs> or a musician uh, or any kind of performing artist. It's the same, it's the same concept. You, if you play the saxophone or you play tennis or I suppose pickleball now. Yeah, um, taking over. You, know, you, you, can, you can never be too good. And the great ones are always learning and always stealing ideas from other people and making them their own. Hmm. So that would be a, a primary you know, point of advice for, for, uh, for listeners. Wherever you can get access to formal or informal ways of, of learning what it means for you to become more effective at mobilizing others towards a better tomorrow, you ought to do that and do it on a regular, yeah. a regular basis. But you can't do it alone. You need help. Yeah, yeah. And so, perhaps we can talk more about that. Yeah, sometime. yeah. That's I, uh, so I was hoping we could do is dive a little bit deeper into that. So <clears throat> you were taking 2,500 managers a year at Ford through, through training. What exactly yeah. were you teaching them to do? Uh, well, we had a number of different kinds of uh, programs. Uh, that usually involved um, some technical or content knowledge about strategy, about about our business operations, um, and about uh, f financial acumen, um, marketing concepts. So there were there were so comp some competence piece, just being good at your job. Yeah, a technical um, skill and knowledge. Uh, the the leadership component it varied <clears throat> across the different programs that we ran, um, but in all cases, in all in every case, it, it involved action learning. Mm -hmm. So the the principle there being you you learn leadership by doing it, surrounded by assessment and support. Um, so conscious, deliberate uh, action in the real world of our company and in your life, uh, surrounded, as I say, by data about the impact that you're having on others, on outcomes that matter okay. <clears throat> in terms of you know, business outcomes, and, and getting coaching support, including from peers, but from others as well to learn from your real experience. That, is, that, that was sort of a central organizing idea for all of our programs. Hmm. Uh, so how did that actually work? And I mean, is there anything that, for example, leaders today could learn from what you implemented inside of, of Ford as far as lessons learned that you think we could bring into other companies today? Well, one of the programs that I am most proud of it because it's been the most long lasting and the one that I have continued to work on since uh, 2000 uh, is a program we call Total Leadership. Hmm. And that is, uh, that is about how you improve performance and results as a leader at work and at home and in the community and for yourself personally. Yeah. So in that interview with Jack Nasser, the, the most important interview of my series of interviews before I was invited to take the job at, at Ford, um, I told him, look, Jack, if you hire me to do leadership development here, it's going to be about the whole person. Because uh, as you mentioned earlier, I founded the Work-Life Integration Project. That was 1991, same year I started the Wharton Leadership Program. Um, and... I was developing with the team of colleagues at Wharton and external advisors of all kinds, new knowledge about how to integrate the different parts of life for mutual gain. And what we did at Ford 
was to create a program, a model of leadership that was about the whole person, that that drew on the knowledge that we were creating and that I was writing about on how do people integrate the different parts of their lives for mutual gain and how do they grow as leaders. And it and in this total leadership program, we distilled that wisdom and made it come alive in a series of mm-hmm. initiatives that part, participants did in our programs that had to do with being real, being whole, and being innovative. Those are the three critical competencies that were principles that people who are good at this at all stages of life are, are able to do. And so we had them do um, exercises that involved articulating their values, the stories of where they had come from that had shaped their values. Their, they wrote their leadership vision and shared that uh, with others, with peer coaches. They looked at the different domains of their lives, work, home, community, and self, and defined how important each one was to them, um, and other exercises that clarified what was important to them. That was the first piece. The second, to be whole, meant to respect the whole person, identifying who are the most important people in your life, at work, or Mm -hmm. in your career, at, at home in your family, however you define that, yeah. in your community, your friends and uh, other groups that you might belong to, and then for yourself, your mind, body, spirit, your emotional health, your physical health, your spiritual growth and development. Um, and and what, what do you expect of them and what do they expect of you? <laughs> and looking at that system of real world social relationships, your world, in light of what's important to you, and then talking to those people, maybe a dozen of them, to engage in dialogue to find out what they really think and feel when they look to you for leadership yeah. in their relationship with you. Having those dialogues and then experimenting, that was the third principle, to be innovative, to act with creativity by continually experimenting with how things get done. And we asked people to design and implement experiments that were intended to create demonstrable value at work, at home, in the mm-hmm. community, and for themselves personally. And they did that. They went out and made change happen and then measured the impact. And whether or not they succeeded or failed, they learned a lot about what it takes to create change that is indeed sustainable because it works not just for you, but for your professional life, your business, uh, your family, and your community. Um, so that that was the heart of... Uh, what I brought to that enterprise and what I've carried through since and written a few books about and deliver that content now and that program in various formats uh, to people and organizations worldwide. Do you want to learn how to create an amazing corporate culture while avoiding the pitfalls that make for a toxic one? If so, I created a brand new eight-part training video series just for you. In total, it's around 30 minutes in length and you can get it right now by going to helpmyculture.com. Go there right now before this training series disappears forever. Again, that is helpmyculture.com and get access to this free eight-part training series on how to create an amazing corporate culture. So it's very interesting. So let me just kind of recap those areas. So it's it's work, home, community, and the self, which uh, I think you talked about as like mind, body, and spirit. Mm-hmm. And... <clears throat> It's a pretty unique approach to leadership, right? Because I think most of the time when people hear about leadership, they think about, you know, competence in your role, like being good at your job. So kind of a two-part question for you. How did you come up with these other elements? Like, is this something that you noticed? And why are all of these elements important? So why can't, for example, you just focus on work, and be really, really amazing at your job. You know, your yourself is not great, community not great, family great, but you're really good when you show up to the office. Why isn't that good enough for you to be a successful leader? Well, I was in the shower one day and it just came to me. Uh, <laughs> it's not how it happened. <laughs> uh, well, we spent a lot of time in the 90s researching in the field. We found people who were nominated by others as being exemplars, people who were good at finding har- some kind of harmony 
or uh, peace, integration uh, among the different parts of their lives, and we studied them. Um, we created a, a, a working group that, that were involved uh, consultants, it involved internal um, leaders, HR people, government representatives, about two dozen people in the, the Wharton Work-Life Roundtable. And we'd go out in the field, we'd convene. It was a long-term and pretty big um, research enterprise from which we gleaned these basic principles of being real, being whole, being innovative. And I wrote about those. Uh, in what I think is the first article about work and life in the Harvard Business Review. It was 1998. Wow. Um, it was called Work and Life, The End of the Zero-Sum Game with uh, Perry Christensen and Jessica DeGroote. And that was, um, that was where we came up with those principles. And with the team, the amazing colleagues that I had at Ford and some external folks who were helping us, we created this total leadership program, which... Um, which merged what we were learning about how people grow as leaders in their business life with what we were learning about how people integrate the different parts of their lives for mutual gain to create hmm. harmony and peace. And it turns out it's the same set of principles, knowing what's important, being real, knowing who's important, being whole in the different parts of your life and uh, creating you know, experiments all the time, being innovative continually trying new ways of getting things done that serve the interests that are important to you. Uh, so that's, that's where, that's where that, those ideas came from. Um, so yes, observations, but in systematic studies of uh, what worked. Um, and those principles have been refined over time, but um, to your question about, well, why not just be good at work? And for some people, that's the case. And indeed, when we ask people to articulate what's most important to you, clarify your values and your vision, everybody writes something different. Yeah. You know, and, and using our exercises and assessment tools, you know, people use them to describe who they are, not who I want them to be or who you know, their mother wants them to be or who their spouse wants them to be or their boss. It's who they want to become. And for some people, work is everything. Yeah. But for most people, it's not. Hmm. For most people, there are other interests that they have. And we also found through other research, we were doing large-scale survey research of people um, in terms of you know, their lives and careers and had written a bunch of articles and books about that. And what we were finding is that people who have, let's call it a, a a diverse portfolio of interests in their lives, they tend to be happier and more successful. Hmm. Which is contrary to the common wisdom that I'm afraid still exists, which is that you can't be really significant in the world unless you completely devote 100% to that one thing. Yeah. It turns out, uh, according to the evidence that I was able to garner and wrote about in a book called Leading the Life You Want, where we illustrated this with a, a set of exemplar leaders, uh, the opposite is true, hmm. that the, the, the truly great ones have commitments and devotions to other parts of their lives than work that give them the strength and the persistence needed to overcome all the obstacles that are required to have a significant impact in the world. Uh, so, you know, th the different parts affect each other in yeah. almost all of us. <laughs> And it's useful to know what those interconnections are so that you can manage them consciously while as much as possible being true to what you really care about, which is not an easy thing to do, yeah. of course. So is the only focusing on work piece, is the argument there that that's just not sustainable over the long run? Like if you only focus on being a good employee or a good leader, that eventually if you don't have balance with those other elements, the work piece is going to at some point crumble as well? Right. Hmm. That's it. Uh, I mean, for some people, that um, that's not the case, and, and they are 100% devoted to their work, and they remain successful by certain metrics yeah. uh, in their work. Um, but for most people, um, a single-minded devotion to only one domain of your life uh, is not the best solution. Uh, and, and what we help people to see 
by pursuing what I call these four-way wins. Just try something that's going to make things better for you in the different parts of your life, even if indirectly. Like, let's say, taking care of yourself so that you show up more energized and focused at work as well as with your family, as well as with your friends. So an indirect impact Mm. on the other domains than self by taking care of self, which is what a lot of people in our programs do. So for example, Um, like eating healthy, getting enough sleep, exercising, yeah, and understanding there, how that translates into the other elements of your, of yourself and uh, your, leader, your leadership as well. Exactly, that's the most common kind of experiment. There are nine types that we've observed, and we they're described and illustrated in the Total Leadership book. And people do experiments, and they try them out, and they realize that it doesn't always have to be a trade-off, which is why I abhor the term balance, and why I try to. I've been trying now for over 30 years to get people to stop using it because, it again, it implies that you have to give up something in one part to get something in the other parts. And, of course, sacrifice at some point is always necessary. You can't have everything. Yeah. You certainly can't have it all at the same time. That's pretty hard to do. I, I've never really seen it. Um, and And instead to think about creating harmony or uh, a greater sense of integration or peace over the course of time, uh, which is why I prefer the metaphor, uh, not just the scales and balance, where you have to trade one for the other, but rather uh, to think about the four domains as like a jazz quartet, Hmm. where what's happening is they're trying to make beautiful music together, uh, but each each player uh, has got their own instrument to try to sound as beautiful as possible, but very much interacting and responsive to what's happening in the other domains. And sometimes, or in the other instruments, right, uh, sometimes you don't hear any anything but the bass and the drums, or mm. just the piano and the, and the trumpet. Uh, and the others are resting, right, over the over a course of a piece of music. So I think that's a better metaphor than yeah. uh, the balancing scales. So, so I want to talk a little bit about the difference between the balance and the integration uh, in a minute, but what would be like the practical manifestations of those four things? So for people listening and watching, watching, they're saying, okay, got it. I got to focus on those four areas, uh, work, home, community, and self. How do you actually put that into practice? Does this mean that every day you kind of think through those four quadrants and give yourself something to improve in each area or how do you how do you like take action on that total leadership and and make it real instead of just you know what i mean like people can understand that those are the four things to do but what do you do after you have that understanding well it's all about action yeah and learning from experience Uh, as i said at the beginning of this conversation that was the hallmark of our work in the in the ford system and in all the work we do in organizations uh, everywhere is you, know, you got to take action and see what you can learn from it about you yeah. and about your impact. Uh, so what, what we help people to do is to design experiments, real world actions that, that they're going to take and then track what's the impact that those actions are going to have on work, on home, on community and on self. So there are, there are a wide variety of experiments that people do based on their own assessment with feedback from coaches and especially peers who are doing the same thing. Um, what's most important to you? What are your core values? You got to start with that. That's the most important thing. What do you really care about? Yeah. So what can you say no to? What must you mm-hmm. say yes to? What's your vision of the world you're trying to create? How would you describe an ideal day 15 years from now in terms of what you're doing and the impact that you're having and the legacy that you're creating? We have everybody write that in a page oh, and share it with other people and get reactions. Uh, they tell stories of the critical episodes in their life histories that have shaped their values. How does that determine who you are now? Hmm. So we spend a lot of time on what's most important to you. And then getting very clear about who is most important to you, why they matter, and what they really think. Not what you think they think, but what they really think about what they need from you. And this is in those four areas. So most important members in family, work, and community. So you, well, like a list of three or five people. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's the heart of the program. That's the heart of the work is who matters and then talking to them. Okay. Which most people are very afraid to do. Yeah. Because, and, and they get a lot of coaching from us and from each other on how to engage in these dialogues to, to do what leaders who are good do well, and that is to face reality. Yeah to get a good picture of what's really happening with the most critical relationships in their lives. And with armed with that knowledge, they always come up with ideas for innovation, for change. Uh, and what you would come up with doing those sets of analyses would be very different than what I would come up with because we live in different worlds. We have different needs, different interests, different values, different opportunities. Everyone's different. It's another hallmark of this approach. There's no cookie cutter. Yeah. It's a model that is customized by and for every individual hmm. in their own setting. And when we did this at Ford, it was revolutionary. And that's what the cover story of Fast Company said in, I think it was February of 2000. Uh, we were creating a revolution by saying to people, we want you to take care of your family and your community and yourself because it's going to be good for our company. Hmm. And they were like, Whoa, okay. And, What's funny, and it was I, a, I actually remember at the time, I think it was in the 80s or 90s, they used to have those lists, right? World's toughest boss, uh, world's, uh, you know, what I, you probably remember those lists, right? And it was kind of like a badge of honor to be on the list or to even work for that, like that kind of a leader. It's like, oh, I work for the toughest boss out there. And then here yes. you are saying like, hey, you know what? We actually want you to take care of your people. Did, did anybody ever come to you and say, Stu, what's wrong with you? I get that every day, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I face, I face skepticism about this approach to this day. Um, I mean, all the time. But what's the critique? Uh, how, can, how can you be asking people to invest more in their families and communities and themselves when we have you know, a hard enough time getting all the stuff done that we need to for our customers, our clients, our investors, et cetera, et cetera? And we now have evidence that shows that when you uh, support people in their quest for greater harmony in their lives, they not only demonstrate greater well-being, greater health, physical and mental health, they actually perform better on the mm -hmm. job, even as they devote a little less attention to their work. So mm. what we find is that people shift as a result of all this, all these exercises that I've described, uh, you know, think, getting clear about what matters, who matters, what they really need from you, and then trying something new that serves their interests and yours. What happens is people devote a little bit less of their mental energy to work and more to the other parts, and they perform better at work as a result because mm. they're more focused they're less distracted, and they bring more energy to the work, and they focus on the more important aspects of it because they've let some other things go, having discovered that what other people expect of them is usually more and a little bit different than what they had thought. And so they adjust their priorities to be better fit with the realities they're trying to uh, deal with. So what did you find the outcome of this was? So when, uh, I think you said it was Fast Company, right, when they, when they wrote about this? and they said it was a revolution, what, what happened? So you're training these thousands of managers in Ford to kind of look at themselves, you know, the, the, the whole self from these different areas. And as they were doing this, what, what was the, the result? Well, uh, and since, in the 20 years since, with hundreds of thousands of people in, you know, companies around the world, we've been doing this, including, of course, with... Uh, our MBA students at, at the Wharton School uh, since 2003. Um, and so we've been studying the impact. And what we find is uh, that people generally feel better about how things are going in the different parts of their lives, and they perform better as a result. Uh, so there's a greater sense of uh, harmony among the different parts and the, their ability to meet or exceed the expectations of people around them improves. Hmm. So um, naturally, they're they're happier. They feel more uh, supported uh, and more optimistic about what what's coming, and their capacity to have a greater sense of control over you know the topsy turvy, ever changing, very confusing world that they live in, that we live in. 
So would you say that they just become better leaders? Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, it's be a better leader, have a richer life. That's the subtitle of my book that's titled Total Leadership. Uh, and we also, at Ford and some other places, we've looked at, we've actually measured economic outcomes uh, for the for the business. Oh. And uh, at Ford, where we had a lot of resources to be able to do this in a, in a systematic way, we saw millions and millions of dollars of cost avoidance, cost savings, productivity improvements as a result of the experiments that people did to improve their their productivity as well as make their lives a little saner and a little less chaotic. So sorry, you cut out there for a second. You said the economic, you, you said productivity, and then what, what were the other things that you said? Well, not, not only did they... Uh, come up with ideas for experiments that they implemented ah. that reduced cost, uh, avoided certain costs, uh, eliminated some hidden costs, like having to do with excessive travel, for okay. example. Um, so innovation. Uh, various innovations in how work gets done that make it smarter, more efficient, and that help them in the other parts of their lives as well. Makes That's sense. That was sort of the you know, the trick yeah, yeah. Uh, of this approach. It, it, it forces you, at, whether you're a first line employee on a shop floor or whether you're a senior executive running the engineering comp, you know, division, uh, it forces you to think about what can I do to create value, not just for my business you know, demands, but for the other parts of my life as well. Yeah. And when you compel people to do that, they come up with ideas. I've never met anyone, and I've, and I've done this with literally you know, 100,000 people or more. Everyone has ideas for what they can do. Yeah. And everyone's ideas are different. And that's an important leadership concept, that you are not the same as anyone else as a leader. You have to figure out the leader you want to be. And that's what we help people to do. I love that. And to practice. Uh, okay, so last 15 minutes or so, I thought we could focus on, on on something specific as far as something actionable, practicable, or practical, applicable for leaders out there. And and one of the areas that I thought would be really interesting to get your feedback on, and if you have any other areas, let me know, is around this idea of how do you make tough choices under pressure, uh, or even just how to think through tough choices in general. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming that with a lot of the leaders that you worked with, there have been times when tough choices have to be made. Do you have any suggestions or frameworks or questions to think about, or even does the approach on total leadership here that you have, does it somehow help leaders make decisions, tough choices when they're under pressure? You won't want to miss my conversation with Stu Friedman as it continues for subscribers on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. And in our continued conversation, we talk about how leaders can make tough choices under pressure, this concept of integrating work and life and why work-life balance isn't really the best way to think about it. We also look at how to, uh, how to make the best career decisions and probably the most impactful part of this entire conversation is the importance of paying attention to signs and how this all comes back to this concept of total leadership and paying attention to signs in different aspects of those four areas that we talked about to help you make the best decisions for your life and for your career so that you can lead a fulfilling life and also achieve professional success. It's really a fascinating conversation. You won't want to miss it. Again, it's only available to subscribers of the show. And if you subscribe, you're going to get access to a bonus episode every single week from one of my amazing guests. I hope you decide to subscribe and support the show. But if not, uh, you could still help me out by just leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. It's what allows me to bring in more amazing guests just like Stu. So thanks again for tuning in. I'll see you next week.